Well, hey guys, my name is Adam Countryman, and I'm the Director of Worship Arts here at Concordia. We're so glad that you've joined us today for our online service. We have some great music in store for you, and our senior pastor, Bill Tucker, has a great message for us as we continue in our series called Attitude Adjustment. Now, there's also a special moment later on in the service just for the kids, so you don't want them to miss that. And we're going to start off a little bit differently. We've all had to adapt to a different way of life these days. A group that is near and dear to my heart, musicians, have had to change the entire way that they make music and get it out to people who need a positive message and inspiration. A friend of ours at Concordia, Dave Madden, he's from Austin, Texas, got together some of the best musicians in the country for a special video. And I asked him if we could share that with you this morning. This is just one example of the creative ways that musicians are coming together and sharing the good news in this time of isolation. I think you're going to love this. And if you've been around Concordia for a bit, you will no doubt recognize some of the faces and voices. So get yourself a fresh cup of coffee, gather around the TV or the iPad, and have a great time in church. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, healthy as the sun. Oh, 
Wasn't that video amazing? Thanks to Dave Madden. And by the way, the, the gal that sang at the beginning of the video with that awesome voice, Nicoya. Nicoya was actually supposed to be with us here at Concordia during this time when we were in COVID-19 exile. And so we look forward to the time in the future when she's with us. But what a wonderful blessing. And what a wonderful blessing that we're able to be together during this crazy time. This is week seven of our COVID-19 exile. And I want to ask you to join me in a word of prayer as we continue. Heavenly Father, thank you for the technology that allows us to be all over the world, literally all over the world, and still worship together. Bless us in this time, Lord. Allow your word to work powerfully in our hearts, to drive away fear, to replace it with confidence and trust in you. Lord, we pray this in your holy name. Amen. We have a God who really is our help in ages past. He's our hope for years to come, but he's also with us right now as we worship in his name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, we would be hopeless if it weren't for Jesus and what he does when he forgives us of our sins. And so we take a moment now just to get honest about our sinfulness as we go to our God in a time of confession. 
Heavenly Father, we know that we are sinful and broken people. We sin against you and we sin against each other in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, and without you. Without the grace that comes from your Son, we would be lost and without hope. And yet, Heavenly Father, this promise is ours. We know that when we lay our sins before you, you are right there to forgive us of our sins. And so we confess our sins to you, especially those sins that trouble us in our hearts in a moment of silence. In Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes these amazing words. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. And so it is no longer I who live, it is Christ who lives in me. You know, what is true of Paul is also true of you. When you lay your sins on Jesus, when you surrender them to him, he takes your sins, he nails them to the cross, and in exchange, he gives you his grace, his life, and his righteousness. Because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross, you have the promise and the assurance that your sins have been forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
You know, when we surrender all to Jesus, all of our sin, all of our shame, in exchange, he gives us hope. And one of the places that we can find the hope of God is in the word of God. And so it's to God's word that we turn now. Today's reading is from 1 Kings chapter 17. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. So Elijah went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and he asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up. And the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. You know, God promises his provision. He always gives to us what we need and even more than what we need. And the greatest thing that he has given to us is his son. And for millennia now, Christians have been confessing their faith in the God who gives everything that we need. And so we do that now again today as we join together in speaking the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, here's a special message just for the kids from our youth pastor, Ben Trank. Hey boys and girls, so glad that you're with us today for today's children's message. We're going to look a little bit at the story that was read a bit ago about the widow from Zarephath. Widow from Zarephath. Can you say that? Say Zarephath. Can you say it three times fast? Zarephath. 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 That's kind of hard, isn't it? A little bit of a tongue twister. Well, this widow, she had almost nothing left. Her and her boy had nothing left. She had just a little bit of oil, a little bit of oil, and a little bit of flour. And she had enough for one last meal. And with that one last little bit, she was invited to be able to give the last of what she had away to Elijah. In the story, what happens when she gives the last of what she has, her jars never run out. God provided. This time she went back to her jars, there was more there. Oh my goodness, it's it's not run out there's more it continued to provide until the famine was over until the drought was done until the rain had come again boys and girls what we learn in this story is that when we have a little bit sometimes we think that we need to hold on to it for ourselves but what God says is even in the little that we have we're invited to be generous and to share with the people around us this means generous with your toys Generous with your talents, generous with your words. And when we share with the people around us, God does huge things. Miracles even. Let's uh, let's pray about that. Please repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love. 
and for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Help me know that everything I have is a gift from you. And help me to be generous with others. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. Thank you so much for streaming with us today. We're delighted to have you as a part of this service, and we're delighted to have you as a part of our family of faith. Hey, if you've been giving to Concordia's ministries over the years, I just want to say thank you. Your support means the world to us. Now, if you'd like to give again today and you're streaming on our website on a desktop or on a laptop, you'll see a little button that says give. All you have to do is click right there and you'll be taken to our giving page. You can also go directly to our website, concordia.cc, or if you prefer to give the old-fashioned way by mailing a check, you can mail it to the address right here on your screen. Now, if you're in need of prayer today, we'd also love to be able to pray with you. And so if you have a prayer request, just go to the website again, concordia.cc slash prayer, and you can send us your prayer request there. Or we have prayer partners standing by right now who would love to pray with you. All you have to do is call the number on your screen. Thank you again for joining us for worship today. We hope you have a great weekend, a great week, and God bless you.
thanks, Natalie, for that great reminder that Jesus gave his life for us and he is always enough for us. You know, because of that promise, we can take all of our needs to our God in prayer. And so we do that now. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for this extraordinary chance to worship together, even while we're apart. Heavenly Father, each one of us comes to this week and to this day with our own struggles and our own concerns and our own burdens. And so we lay those before you now in the privilege that we have of prayer. Heavenly Father, for those who are sick, especially for those who are struggling with COVID-19, we pray that you would protect them and bring them back to health. Father, be with all of those who are on the front lines of battling this disease. For our medical professionals, we ask you to protect them and give them strength and wisdom to do their jobs faithfully and well. For our leaders, for our president, for all of those who are trying to make big decisions about the best path forward, we pray that you would give them wisdom too so that they would make the right choices for our nation and for the world. Heavenly Father, even in the midst of trying times, we know that you have this. You have us in the palm of your hand. And we thank you for that promise. And so we give you thanks and we give you praise, knowing that no matter what we face, we never face it alone. We walk together as a family of faith and we walk with you. We thank you for that promise and we pray in the name of Jesus who has promised to be with us. And now together we pray the prayer that he's taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
I don't know if you've ever had this experience or not, but you know, I, I think of a time like maybe a Christmas vacation where the family is all off and everybody's together and you're planning on a, a special time and, and things are going along well, but the longer that you're together, the more on edge at least some of the people begin to be. And, and before long, you find yourself thinking, man, they could really use an attitude adjustment. You know, as I think about this COVID-19 exile that we're experiencing, and lots of us are, are at our homes and together with people that we love to be with, but not necessarily constantly and all the time, have you ever begun to notice that some of the people around you could use an attitude adjustment? Or maybe, like me, you've been in various situations and all of a sudden you've realized that, man, something's bothering you way more than it ought to. That, that some situation is causing you a lot more frustration than it ought to. And you think to yourself, it's me who needs an attitude adjustment. You know, it's, it's amazing. In this time, there are so many pressures downward on our attitude, it's really easy for our attitudes to begin to slip. And yet God's Word invites us to have a very particular type of attitude. In Philippians chapter 2 it says, you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. Wow. That's a, a tall order. That our attitude should be like the attitude that Jesus had. So how do we do that? And what's it look like? And especially in a time like this where there's so much pressure on our attitude to, to slip, so much pressure that moves our attitude towards something that's not so Christ-like, what do we do? Because I find that, that I and the people that I'm talking to, oftentimes, instead of having peace, we feel stress. Instead of being patient and, and forbearing, we find ourselves angry and quick to frustration. Instead of being hopeful, we take in all of this information, we hear all of the uncertainty, we hear the, the dangers and the situations and the, the overwhelming financial news, and we begin to feel hopeless. Dear friends, that's not what God wants for us. It's not what he wants for the people who are around us, but it's not what he wants for us. He wants us to have the attitude of Christ that's not only hopeful, it's an attitude that's confident. And especially in light of all of the financial pressure that we are experiencing. I mean, think about it. So many things are uncertain. So much is out there that, that we just don't understand. No matter what the government is trying to do, no matter what people are trying to do to help one another, there is a lot of uncertainty. And so we've got to ask ourselves, how can we respond to this pressure with a Christ-like attitude? And especially, 
How can we move from financial fear to financial confidence? You know, it's sort of interesting to think about how all of that works. The job loss numbers are enormous. Just in the last month, 22 million people lost their job. When it comes to the the whole issue of our national debt, it's skyrocketing. No matter what the government is trying to do to help people out and help corporations out, that national debt is still skyrocketing. And we know that one day that's going to come due. When it comes to the whole idea of, of people, Think about the pictures in that tremendous message last weekend that Pastor Zach showed us. 10,000 cars here in San Antonio waiting to get food at the food bank. I mean, we don't have to look very far to realize that, that our economy is in big trouble and there's no end in sight. These are hard times. And it's easy for us to become anxious. It's easy for us to become frustrated. It's easy for us to begin to to slide into fear. But I want you to know something. These are difficult times. These are hard times. But the idea of financial pressure, of economic stress, isn't new. In fact, that brings us to our text for today. Because in our text, we're, we're looking at the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel is in big trouble. Their economy has tanked. Because here's the, the way it works. Whenever it comes to the economy, there are two extremes that are disaster. One is too much, and the other is too little. We see that in our own world. I mean, just a few days ago, we had the circumstance where, where the price of crude oil went into negative territory. Because if you don't have enough oil, then the prices skyrocket. And we pay enormous prices at at the pump for gasoline. If there's too much crude oil, like there is right now, the demand is low. And so the folks producing gasoline don't have anywhere to put their gasoline. And so they're reducing the amount that they're refining. And so there's less demand for the crude oil. And now there's nowhere to put the crude oil. So we've got too much. And that causes the prices to go way, way down. Too much or too little is a big problem. Well, the same is true even in an agrarian economy like the economy of Israel. Too much rain produces flooding. That's catastrophically bad. I mean, think about Hurricane Harvey and all of the disaster that came when there was too much rain. On the other end, we have too little rain. And when there's too little rain, it produces something called drought. And we know a little bit about drought, but but when it comes to the people of Israel and when it comes to our text for today in 1 Kings, they are experiencing a catastrophic drought. People are dying. There's nowhere to turn, and the food is in such small supply. The economy is devastated. And that brings us to our story because today we're going to take a look at a man named Elijah. Now you've heard of Elijah because Elijah is a great prophet. And Elijah is facing the circumstance where he has no food. He has no way to sustain his own life. And so the question is, where will Elijah go to get relief from this financial hardship, this terrible drought? Well, the answer comes in 1 Kings chapter 17. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So in the midst of this drought, God speaks to his prophet Elijah, and he tells him to go to this town named Zarephath in this area, this region called Sidon. Now, you need to understand something that's really important about this. Zarephath was not a kind of place that a guy like Elijah would go to. You see, Zarephath was in Sidon, and Sidon was a a focal point for the worship of Baal, a false god. Elijah going to Zarephath in Sidon was kind of like you and me deciding we're going to take a trip to North Korea. And the reality is when we get there, we will discover there are a lot of ways, a ton of ways that we can get in big big trouble. That's the situation with Elijah. He's called to go to this place where there's nothing but trouble for him. But God says go. And even when it seems like there's no hope, even when it seems like he's being directed to the wrong thing, we need to remember God always 
has a plan. And God's plan is always a good plan. And the fact of the matter is, God is sending Elijah to Zarephath and Sidon to take care of him. That brings us to verse 10. He, Elijah, went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me a piece of bread, please. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. This poor lady is at the end of her rope. All of her resources are exhausted. She has nothing left except a tiny little bit of flour, and she's going to take that flour, and she's going to make some bread, and she and her son will have their last meal. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home. And do as as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Man, I love this story. What an incredible moment, and what an amazing scene. And of course, as you might expect, there are three lessons that that I want to draw from this one short line that Elijah speaks to this woman. Verse 13, he says to her, Do not be afraid. You know, we just finished a series right before Easter on Fear Not. And we're going to come back to that again today because the truth is, it is so easy when no one can give the answers, when no one knows what's going to happen, when things look dire and dark, and especially financially, economically, things look like they are really overwhelming and scary. It's easy to fall into fear. I want to learn. I want to learn from Elijah, and I want to learn from this this widow from Sidon, and I want to understand what it means to not be afraid when the financial and economic situation is absolutely horrible. And so, in order to adjust our hearts and our minds from from financial fearfulness to financial faithfulness, you know, that that little word game is from Pastor Zach, right? He loves that kind of stuff, but but it fits, right? How do we move from financial fearfulness to financial faithfulness? What do we need to do? What kind of attitude adjustment do we need? Point number one, we must talk. We've got to talk to people. We've got to get it out. When we keep it on the inside, all it tends to do is become worse and worse because all we do is create feedback loops for ourselves that have no information and only the fear running rampant. I mean, think about what happens here. You need to recognize that under normal circumstances, Elijah would never talk to a woman like this widow. And under normal circumstances, this widow would have never talked to a prophet like Elijah. They're from two completely different worlds. I mean, there's a, there's a huge cultural and theological difference between them. We've got Elijah, who is a, a, a son of Israel, and he worships the God of Israel. And we've got this widow from, from Zarephath in Sidon, and, and she worships Baal, and she's not from Israel. She's from the nation of Sidon, which is an enemy nation. And so there's no reason, no way. Not only that, the men and women didn't speak to one another unless they were related to one another. There's no way that this should happen. But it does. You know, it reminds me of, of another time in the life of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus, it says, withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. So we're in the same region, right? We're in the same general area. And Jesus goes to this place, and a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him. Now again, the Canaanites were Baal worshipers. So here is a Jew who worships the God of Israel interacting with a pagan 
Baal worshiper again. This woman is desperate. Her paganism, her Baal worship has left her life and her family broken. It's a tragic circumstance, and she is profoundly desperate. Crying out, it says, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. Now you may say, well, what, what's that all about? Well, Jesus is testing his disciples. He wants to see how they're going to react. And so the, the text goes on. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she, she, she keeps crying out after. She's making this, this huge commotion. Get rid of her, Jesus. And you need to realize that's the normal reaction. That's the reaction that any person of Israel would have to a person from Canaan, uh, from a person of Sidon. That's the, the reaction that they would have toward that, that kind of person. So what's amazing is that Jesus not only has this interaction with this Canaanite woman, that Elijah has this interaction with this widow from Zarephath. But what I love is that Elijah is willing to talk to this widow. And this widow is willing to talk to Elijah. And it makes all the difference. Because what happens from here is filled with hope. They have a conversation. Dear friends, when it comes to our whole attitude adjustment with regard to financial fear, we've got to be talking. We've got to talk to people who, from a financial standpoint, are wiser than we are. We need financial advisors, and that doesn't just mean professionals. That means people who've been around longer, who know more, who have some wisdom and some insight, who can help us make wise decisions. Because normally it's not about some kind of sophisticated play that we will make. It's about making wise, careful, prayerful decisions. When it comes to talking with folks about our financial fears, we also need to talk to people who financially are in the same place that we are. People who are facing the same kinds of circumstances. People who have the same anxieties because we can be an encouragement to one another, especially if we have it in our minds that we're not going to get drawn down into the fear. We're not going to go to the worst case scenarios. We're going to encourage one another and lift each other up and be of support to those people who are in the same situation we're in. And by the way, there are all kinds of them because we're all in this brand new uncharted territory together. One more thing when it comes to talking about our financial fears. We need to talk to people who are financially facing bigger struggles than we are. Because again, we can be an encouragement, but maybe, maybe you'll be called to be a mentor. Maybe you'll be called to be someone who, who helps to lift them up and, and bring them along to see things that maybe they don't know. Because remember, being a mentor isn't about having all the answers. Being a mentor is about being just a few steps ahead of the person that you are mentoring. We need to talk to people who are financially wiser than we are. We need to talk to people who are financially in the same place that we are. And we need to talk to people who are facing even bigger struggles than you and I are. Remember Jesus' parable when it comes to the, the whole idea of the, the various managers? And there are three managers, and Jesus tells the parable of the talents. So there is this master, and he gives to three different servants three different amounts of talents. Now, these are big sums of money, right? But he gives to one of them five talents. He gives to another three talents. And he gives to one of them just one talent. Now, it's still a lot of money to invest, and that's what he expects. He expects that each of them will take the sum that he's given, invest it wisely, and provide a return to him when he comes back. Well, the man with five talents does very well. The man with three talents does very well. But the man with only one talent, when the master comes back, he's in big, big trouble. I'm in Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 24. The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. 
So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. See, what's amazing is that this, this servant who had one talent, still a, a big amount of money to invest, buried it in financial fear. He was so paralyzed that he wasn't able to do anything. Dear friends, you and I cannot do the same thing. We've got to talk to somebody. We've got to make a call. We've got to find someone who can help us through and think it through so that we don't find ourselves isolated and alone. Point number one, we must talk about our financial concerns and fears. But point number two, we need to give. Now I know that sounds counterintuitive, but just bear with me. Elijah and this widow talk, but I'm guessing that at some certain point in the conversation, this widow wishes that she had never spoken to Elijah. And that point, by the way, was the point where Elijah asked her to share the last bit of food that she has with him. Picking up in verse 11 of chapter 17. Bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a little jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first... Make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. You know, it's kind of interesting. When, when you've got a whole bunch of something, it's easy to share, isn't it? When you've got a, a whole bunch of any one particular thing and you find out that somebody needs it, it's easy to say, oh yeah, we'll share, come on, take what you need. I mean, think about the, the whole crisis with toilet paper. If you had a whole warehouse full of toilet paper, you would absolutely be unafraid to say to your friends, hey, come on over, I've got everything I need, I'm happy to share with you. But what if you were down to your last couple of rolls? All of a sudden, you get a little more anxious. Maybe you're down to your last roll, and it's not a, a roll, it's half a roll. And it becomes really anxious Really stressful to think about sharing that with anyone. Think about where this woman is. She doesn't have plenty. She doesn't have a little. She's got nothing. She's at the end of her rope. She knows that she's at the end of her rope. She's got enough for one last tiny, meager little meal. And then she and her son will die. And Elijah doesn't just ask her to share with him. He asks her to share with him first. Feed me, and then feed yourself and your son. Wow. Can you imagine how difficult that would have been to hear, let alone do? And yet... She did it. Verse 15, she went away and did as Elijah had told her. She shares even when it makes absolutely no sense to share. You know, when I think about that, I think about our beloved Concordia family. I need you to know something. You have boggled my mind. Your generosity and faithfulness in the midst of this, this COVID-19 crisis with its health issues and its financial issues and its employment issues and its security issues and everything else that's involved, your faithfulness in giving to our beloved Concordia has been utterly amazing and it's inspiring. But I understand something about your giving. It's based on faith. It's based on our response to God out of his enormous generosity to us. You know, it's not just the giving, by the way. It's all of the different ways that, that people are reaching out and helping, the ways that folks are volunteering. You know, take, for example, the food drive that we had just a, a few days ago. We took down to the San Antonio Food Bank 
6,462 pounds of food. That's over three tons of food. It's utterly amazing. But you know, it also goes to a, to a very foundational principle about our giving. And, and it goes like this. It's, it's so important that we don't get caught in, in the how much question, in what we can or what we can't afford to give. It's so much more important that we focus on the how to give. You know, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians about giving. And this is what he says. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, Paul doesn't focus on how much, but he does focus on how to give. You know, that reminds me, as we were collecting food items last Sunday and Monday, just before we were finishing up on Monday morning, a, a, a person came driving up and they, they opened the back of their car and I reached in to take what was there and it was just a tiny little bag. Just a, a couple of cans of food and, and a bag of dried goods. And the person looked at me because they'd gotten out of the car to open that rear hatch. They, they looked at me and, and I could see for just a minute there was sort of a, almost a reluctance. And this is what she said. I know it's not very much. And I almost didn't come. But then I thought, if we all do just a little bit with a congregation like ours, it can make a big difference. Well, it made over three tons of difference. What an amazing reality. This young lady understood perfectly It's not about how much. It's about how we give. Joyfully, cheerfully, expectantly. Kind of like Pastor Zach talked about last weekend with those barley loaves. We give out of our poverty with the full and certain assurance that our God does miraculous things with little bits of nothing. That's who he is. That's the power that he has. That leads to the final point, which explains how this widow is able to give at all. Point number three. So remember, point number one, we must talk. Point number two, as crazy as it seems, we need to give. Point number three, we have hope. No matter what we're facing, no matter what the circumstance, we are always in Christ. We always have hope. Think about this widow. She is hoping in the face of an impossible situation. She is is putting her trust in Elijah's promise about his God. She's risking everything that what he's saying to her is true. I mean, listen to what Elijah says. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Now she doesn't worship Elijah's God. She doesn't even know Elijah's God. But she is hoping against hope that he will provide, that he will keep his promise. And he does. Verse 16 The jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Dear friends, you need to understand something. God still provides. You know, if we go back to Paul in the very beginning when we were talking about his instruction on our attitude from Philippians, Paul is writing in the worst possible circumstance, not only in exile, he is writing from prison. And yet, what he writes is amazing. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. My God will meet your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, God still meets our needs. And I want you to notice something. 
Maybe you're struggling with fear. Maybe you don't feel confident that God's going to meet your needs. Maybe you're struggling with faith in general. Let me give you a word of reassurance. What we have and what God gives is never dependent upon our faith and how big or strong or boisterous or bold our faith is. What we have and what God gives is always dependent upon His strength, His resources, His faithfulness. And His strength and resources and faithfulness are beyond anything that we can imagine. God is faithful. And if that weren't enough, you need to understand that God isn't just faithful. God always gives us his best. You know, I've suggested on many occasions to our beloved Concordia family that we memorize Romans chapter 8. It's one of those powerful cornerstone chapters in scriptures, and I still would encourage you, in this time in particular, start reading it through. Read Romans 8 every day. Read it through and allow it to sink into your mind and memorize it. But in particular, right now, I want to take a look at verse 32 of Romans 8. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now, we know God is gracious, right? God is, is a God who gives freely and generously. And if he's willing to give his own son, do you really think, Paul is saying, do you really think that he won't be willing to give out to you whatever you need, no matter what you're facing right now? So here's another way to think about this passage, Romans 8.32. Have you ever heard of reverse engineering? Reverse engineering is this fascinating uh, way of understanding and making things better. And reverse engineering essentially takes a completed work. And it, and it takes a look at that work, breaks it down, divides it up, tears it apart to understand how it works so that you can make something else work better. Well, What's fascinating about that is that I've been reading about the COVID-19 virus and the possibility of vaccines, and one of the ways that they're looking for a vaccine is by reverse engineering other successful vaccines to, to hopefully find a vaccine that not only will be successful, but find one more quickly. But what occurs to me is that in Romans 8.32, Paul is being inspired by God's Holy Spirit to invite us to reverse engineer our hope to reverse engineer our confidence in this world that's so filled with fear. Let's take a look again. What does he say? Verse 32, beginning in the first half of the verse, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. So get the point. That's God's completed work. God gave his son on the cross. Jesus said, it is is finished. The work is complete. So salvation and forgiveness and hope and eternity, God has finished that whole work for us in his son on the cross. That's the completed work. But now let's do a little reverse engineering. If God sacrificed his son because we are that important to him, if he would go to that extreme to save us, then listen to what Paul says in the second half of the verse. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If you do the reverse engineering, you realize that God loves us. He treasures us. And he wants us to trust him no matter what. Even in the face of a deadly virus, even in the face of uncertain times, even in the face of a financial future that's scary and unclear, God wants us to trust that he will graciously give us all things. Dear brothers and sisters, my hope is with that reverse engineering, you and I can move forward with an attitude adjustment, stronger, clearer, and more confident about our financial future. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of your word. And thank you, Lord, that in your word we can look at an ancient story and still discover a truth that applies to us today. Lord, help us to be wise and faithful 
Help us in the midst of a time where so many are frightened and bearing their treasure. Lord, help us to shine like stars in the universe. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, dear friends, I invite you to receive this word of blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, as you leave this COVID exile worship online, go and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen. Thank you.